Hello, my name is David Scher. I'm back again for another lecture in Physics 572, Introduction to Health Physics. We're talking about radioactivity and uh, the radiation that's emitted during radioactive decay. Uh, we covered a good bit of that last time, but uh, today we're going to uh, finish up on how radioactivity, uh, the transitions that are possible with radioactivity, and spend a little bit of time talking about the energy that's being emitted. And then we're going to talk a bit about sources of information, sources of data uh, for this uh, about radioactive decay. Okay. okay, so last time we talked about the uh, nucleus is composed of neutrons and protons. The neutrons and protons share quarks, to, and this causes a binding, uh, uh, an attractive force between them. And uh, that's the strong nuclear force that is attractive. In addition, the positive charges in the protons repel each other from the uh, electrical force. And so the, the combination of these forces uh, produce some elements or some nuclear uh, nuclides, some, some arrangements that are more stable than others. The, all the different possible arrangements of neutrons and protons that exist in nature are shown in the chart of the nuclides. We talked about that la last time. The neutrons shown in black are the ones that are the stable configurations of neutrons and protons. The uh, nuclides that are around them, the boxes that are around them, are unstable. Some are neutron rich, they have too many neutrons. Some are neutron deficient. Or you could just equivalently say some are proton rich and proton deficient. The point is they don't have the optimal blend of neutrons and protons to make the nucleus stable. And so the, there are different transitions that uh, the nucle nucleus can undergo to move towards stability. Um, there were some, I'm, I made some changes on this slide. There were some mistakes on it before. Uh, electron capture occurs in neutron deficient nuclides. It's a proton that's a, a, a combining with an electron to produce a neutron, adding more neutrons and therefore moving toward the, the line of stability. I think I made a mistake about neutron, uh, neutron emissions was listed on the other side. I think I had those two reversed. It's a rare phenomenon, but it's possible for neutrons to be emitted directly from the nucleus, and that would occur obviously in neutron rich. Uh, nuclides. Now, um, we talked a little bit just to mention that there are, in, in heavy elements, uh, an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus, can be emitted to carry away some of the energy so to allow the nucleus to move toward the line of stability. Um, and then there are internal, there's internal structure, there's energy levels within the nucleus, uh, and there are transitions possible in that. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more today. So here's an example showing the, some isomers of nickel 60. There are different energy levels in the nucleus in addition to uh, um, having unstable configuration of neutrons and protons. There are shells where uh, in the nucleus where, where uh, nu nucleons can be at higher energy than they need to be. Now, in order for us to see these energy levels, something's got to happen to promote those nucleons to the higher energy levels. Just like in the atomic uh, world where we saw those shells, something has to happen to move the electrons to a higher energy shell. Then when they move, uh, relax to the lower energy states, they give off uh, x-rays or visible photons. The same sort of thing happens with uh, a nucleus. So one way that these higher energy states can be populated is from radioactive decay. So an unstable nucleus like cobalt-60 can undergo decay, and that can place the, the nickel-60 uh, nucleus in a couple of its uh, higher energy states, um, its excited states. So um, when a nucleus is in its higher energy state, it can move to a lower state and give away, give off a photon just like the atomic process. Um, when it's undergoing these changes, it doesn't change atomic number like it does in beta decay or alpha decay. 
All it does is move from one energy level to another and give off a photon. Now let's look at the total number, the total energy involved here. The um, one way it can undergo decay is 0 0.31 energy, uh, MeV of beta energy can move it to this highest state in nickel 60, and then it can give off a 1.17 MeV photon. If I add the 0 0.31 with the 1.17, I get a total of 1.48. So from this state of energy state in cobalt 60, this intermediate state in nickel 60 is 1.48 MeV less. And it can get there either way, but the total amount of energy changed from moving from cobalt 60, no matter which path it takes, is the same amount of energy, 1.48 MeV, to get to this uh, intermediate state in nickel 60. And then after it, uh, the nucleus gets to this intermediate energy state, it can um, decay again, relax to the ground state, and give off a 1.33 MeV uh, photon. So the total amount of energy moving from cobalt 60 to nickel 60 is 2.81 MeV. It gets to this intermediate state with 1.48 MeV and then 1.33 MeV to get to the ground state. Okay, so um, I do want to make mention, well, I'll mention on the next slide, okay. Um, so no matter what path it takes, it gives up the same, the same amount of energy is emitted either as a beta particle or as a photon. Now, remember I said before that the beta particles are created uh, along with an antineutrino, or in, in this case, an antineutrino, and that antineutrino carries away some of the energy. Now, in this kind of diagram on the right, we're interested in looking at the energy levels, the different energy levels, and they have to all add up. So what's printed on this diagram is the endpoint energy that I mentioned before. So some data sources that we'll talk about later show the endpoint energy. Um, now, what is the change in energy here? I mentioned before there's a mass defect. Remember those atomic mass units and how the uh, parts, the, the energy of the parts were more than the energy in the total uh, mass of the, of the nucleus because of the binding energy. Well, the change, the Q value of this nuclear reaction is based on the change in binding energy. So you do the, figure out the mass defect for the parent, the path, mass defect for the progeny, and that difference is what the, the, the amount released in the nuclear decay. Okay. So that's what this Q is. I mentioned it was 2.81 MeV, no matter which path it goes by. Um, so as we saw in the last slide, there are competing modes. Here we had two different possible betas that could be emitted. Here's another example, a molybdenum-99 undergoing a beta decay to technesium. There's an intermediate step, uh, intermediate energy level in technesium, uh, technesium-99M. It's metastable. The, the, the nucleus can stay in this state for some short period of time. About 88% of the beta particles go move to this intermediate step, and then the, the, the nucleus relaxes and gives off a photon. About 12% of the time, the molybdenum uh, beta particle goes straight to the ground state. So um, it's very similar to what we saw before in the cobalt 60, nickel 60. Um, the half-lives for this beta particle is about 66 hours, and the half-life for this metastable state is about six hours. Now, even though there are two modes of decay, there's only one half-life for this transition. It's just that fewer of them go in one route than, than another. The same is true here, one half-life, 66 hours, two possible modes of decay. Okay, notice in this chart, the technesium-99 that is created is also radioactive. And, and it, well, first of all, a molybdenum decays in technesium-99, that's radioactive, decays into to technesium-99 ground state. Uh, but technesium-99 is also radioactive with a very long half-life about 211,000 years. 
um, or almost 2 billion hours if we use the same units as we're using for the others. Six hours, 66 hours, and about two and 1.8 billion hours. Okay, so um, before, last time we talked about the kinetics, the rate of decay for uh, nuclear decay, uh, the number of the decay per unit time is proportional to the number of atoms present, and that leads to a, a transformation rate that's the number transfer of, of atoms in the excited state are, is equal to the original number that were present at the beginning times e to the minus lambda t. Lambda is the decay parameter. It's a property of the radioactive, particular radioactive decay, particular nuclide. The half-life, I mentioned before, the half-lives of these different materials. The half-life is related to that decay parameter by this equation. We derived it last time. Uh, and the mean life, the, the average amount of time before decay is also related to the, de the uh, decay parameter in this way. This is all reviewed as a slide that's repeated from last time. Now let's talk about the kinetics for a decay series, where we have one isotope producing another, which is also radioactive, which decays itself. In that case, we have a, a parent uh, compartment, some number of atoms that are parent atoms, with some decay parameter, lambda alpha, they become um, uh, progeny, also radioactive. And with some different de decay parameter, they become a stable or final uh, state. Okay, so the number of atoms that are present in the A state is the amount that was originally there, e to the minus lambda t. This is the same thing we saw last time. The activity, which is the number times the decay uh, parameter, is equal to the activity, e to the minus lambda t. I just multiply lambda in both cases. Now let's look at the number of atoms in compartment B. Okay, we have compartment B. Initially, there are none there. What's being added to it? The amount that's being added to it is lambda A times whatever is left in compartment A. And the amount being subtracted is the decay parameter times whatever is in the part, uh, uh, compartment B. Okay, so we solve this differential equation and we get we come up with this solution it's worked out in uh, some detail uh, in um, uh, Staben's book uh, and I'd be happy to go over it with anyone who would like to, to see that in detail but the result that is there's a relationship between the, the amount in compartment B depends on the initial amount present in compartment A and then all these decay parameters, they fit into the equation. Now, if we look at the activity in part, compartment B, it's lambda B times NB, right? So let's multiply everything we've got there. Lambda A times NA is the initial act, uh, activity of compartment A at time zero. So if we multiply this all out, then the amount that's in a compartment, the activity in compartment B, the number of transformations per second, is given by this formula here. Notice it's a ratio of the decay parameters out in front and then decay parameters that relate to compartment A and compartment B. Uh, we could reconfigure this, and we will, uh, by uh, just combining terms. And we bring this A0e to the minus lambda A out, which becomes A of T. Here we have right here on the top, A of T is equal to A0 e to the minus lambda T. And then this is what's left in the parentheses. That's just simple math. Um, so that's uh, these, these two bottom equations are equivalent and this describe the kinetics of the, the daughter product or the, the progeny compared to the parent nuclide. Now we're going to talk about three cases that are special cases of the, in that uh, situation and see what we can find out about those uh, situations. What is it that's, that's interesting that we find out about these? First is what if we have a very long-lived parent? What if we have a parent that has carbon-14, uh, a 6,000-year half-life, or 
even longer, radium or uranium, very long half-lives. Well, when the, the, the parent product has a very, very long half-life compared to the daughter product, then that means that the decay parameter is much smaller than the daughter decay parameter. Less than a percent, perhaps, depending on what these two uh, half-lives are. So in that case, lambda B minus lambda A, which was part of this equation in a couple of places, that's essentially equal to lambda B. Lambda A is very, very small if T1 half is very, very long. That means that the equation we had from before reduces to this equation. The activity in the, the daughter product is equal to the activity in the parent product, one minus an exponential. So we have a plot here from Stavins' book showing that what that looks like. This is a logarithmic plot. That means that instead of, uh, uh, if there's a radioactive decay, instead of trailing off as an exponential with a curve slug, on a, a semi-log plot, uh, a, a radioactive decay would be a straight line. Well, in this case, the radioactive decay has an ingrowth that uh, uh, increases until it reaches the activity of that long life parent. So in secular equilibrium with a very long life parent, the, in the end, the daughter product, of the, the progeny has an activity equal to the parent after a very long period of time. And the rate of growth is given by this. So when time is equal to zero, e to the minus zero, e to the zero is one. So one minus one is zero. At time equals zero, there is no daughter product. When time is very large, e to the minus lambda t uh, becomes a very big number. So e to the minus a big number is zero, and it becomes equal to the parent. And in between, this is what we have. So that's secular equilibrium. It shows up in a number of cases uh, and can be useful to us in our uh, safety work. The, another situation is what if the parent half-life is somewhat longer than the progeny, but it's not hugely different. We're not talking about several thousand year half-life. Okay. Um, in that case, uh, we can go back to our equation that we had here at the bottom or the one that's right above it, either, they're the same. And we'd see that the daughter product, uh, Activity B is related to activity A by some uh, factor lambda B over lambda B minus lambda A in the parentheses out front times the activity of the um, parent product. And then there's some ingrowth equation. But after a very long period of time, lambda E to the minus, if T gets to be very big, E to the minus a big number is zero. And so it's one minus zero. It's just the, the relationship between the daughter product and the parent product is that the, the daughter product is lambda B over lambda B minus lambda A times the parent. Now notice, because we're subtracting something on the bottom, the, the, the number on the bottom is smaller than the number on top. So the activity of B, when it gets out here in, in this equilibrium state, is going to be bigger than the activity of the parent. The, the progeny activity is greater than the parent activity after long periods of time. Okay, this is important in a lot of applications. We'll talk more about it. What happens if the, the uh, progeny has a half-life longer than the parent? So uh, you have a short-life parent and a long-life uh, 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 progeny. So for example, what we talked about before, this case where the uh, parent product uh, of this is technesium molybdenum 99 to technesium 99 to ruthenium 99. This is a very long half-life in the daughter, very relatively shorter half-life in the parent. What does the, the, the result look like then? Well, there is no equilibrium. The, the short-lived daughter decays away, and the uh, long-life parent simply grows to some equilibrium condition. Once all of the, the daughters, uh, the parent product is decayed away, the daughter product just undergoes its own decay at whatever rate that is. Okay, um, so 
what is the relationship of this level of the, the parent product that he, at, at, after a long period of time compared to the initial daughter product? Well, activity is equal to the decay constant times the number present. So let's look at the, the activity way out here for daughter compared with the activity initially in the parent. Uh, then we, what, as it turns out, the relation, the ratio of the daughter activity to the parent activity is the, the ratio of the decay constants or the inverse uh, ratio of the half-lives. So in this case, the parent product, molybdenum 99 has a half-life, or technesium 99, M, the metastable, has a half-life of six hours. And then the technesium 99 in the ground state, the parent product has a half-life of 1.85 billion hours. So this ratio is about three times 10 to the minus nine. It's a very small number. The fraction, this this line, horizontal line in the, the daughter product is very, very small compared to the original activity. Because this number is so low, there's often situations where we can ignore the technesium 99 in the progeny and treat it as though it's, it's essentially not radioactive at all. Now, if we start off with a large amount of technesium, we can't ignore it. But if we have a, a moderate amount of technesium 99M, short half-life that undergoes decay, there's very, very little activity in the, the parent. Okay. There are other decay series we should talk about with the heavy elements. They're called the actinides. The actinides are the elements above 89 on the periodic table. That is 89 is the atomic number uh, and greater. And notice that there are no stable nuclides with atomic number greater than 82. So all the actinides, actinides are radioactive. So a long-lived radioactive decays into something else, that's going to be radioactive, decay into somebody else, something else, that's going to be radioactive, decay into something else. And so we end up with these series that look like this. There are uh, three series that occur in nature. One is the, uh, and, and because many of these undergo alpha decay, remember I mentioned that for heavy elements, alpha decay is uh, uh, often a common way of, of uh, a common mode of decay. So the, a lot of the changes change the uh, mass number by four. Um, uranium-238 has a half-life of about four and a half billion years which is about the age of the Earth. So half of all the uranium that was present at the dawn of the Earth is still present in the soil of the Earth. Uh, that's why we mine it up. We can produce uh, use uranium uh, that's mined from the Earth. Um, so uranium-238, if you look at what 238 is, that number 238 is equal to 4 times n plus 2. So... 236 divided by 4 is evenly divisible by 4. 59. Okay. So as an evenly divisible by 4 number, um, uranium-235 gives rise to the actin actinium series. They call this series uranium series. Uranium-235 gives rise to what's called the actinium series. Those are 4n plus 3. Uh, thorium-232 is a long-lived isotope that gives rise to the thorium series that are 4N. Now, there is a series that's 4N plus 1. It's not found in nature because none of the nuclides in that series has a geological time uh, half-life. Um, 100,000 years, I think, is the longest half-life. Um, so uh, it's not found in nature. It does exist. Um, in, it can be produced uh, by man-made. So these are what the this different series look like. These are the different elements on the right. So it's undergoing decay. Uh, uranium-238 undergoes beta decay, excuse me, alpha decay. It moves down two elements to thorium. That undergoes beta decay. Uh, so same mass number, just change the atomic number by one. That produces uranium-234. That undergoes uh, alpha decay, moves down to thorium. There, then there's a series of alpha decays and some beta decays that produces all these isotopes that are present in the, the Earth. 
Um, there's another series called the Actinium series. It starts with uranium-235. Again, undergoes alpha decay and beta decays in the same thing. It's called Al Actinium series because actinium is the longest life or, or easiest to, to uh, was first discovered uh, in this series. Um, let's see. Um, it's a higher activity because it has a short half-life. Uh, the thorium series uh, starts off with thorium-230. It undergoes uh, its decay chain and all its daughter products uh, are present as well. Uh, thorium is a very long half-life, 1.4 times 10 to the 10th, 14 billion years. Okay, um, now let's mention uh, the um, units that we use for quantity of radioactivity. I mentioned before that in the international system of units called the SI units, the uh, it's the number of transformations per second. One transformation per second is a Becquerel. I mentioned that before. There's an older unit called the Curie that was uh, used uh, before the establishment of SI units. The uh, traditional unit uh, is uh, of the Curie is based on the activity in one gram of radium. So last time we talked about specific activity, the number of transformations per gram. So I believe you'll do a homework problem where you look at the look up the um, decay parameter for uh, radium, and you'll calculate what the specific activity is. So you can show that one gram of radium has this many transformations per second, uh, 37 billion becquerel. Uh, I want to remind you there are other, so we've been talking about radioactivity, and now we're talking about radiation. So I want to remind you there are other types of radiation that uh, come from atomic processes. Last time we talked about characteristic x-rays. When there's a transformation uh, in the shell of the um, atomic electrons, that can give rise to a photon that can be an X-ray. Sometimes when these transitions take place, the energy is not sent off, uh, sent off as an uh, X-ray. It can be converted or transferred to an electron from the, the, uh, the sh an outer shell, and that can be an OJ electron. Um, and finally, when there are uh, isomeric, when, when gamma rays are emitted by the nucleus, they can be transferred to electrons in the electron cloud, and these are called internal conversion electrons. Finally, there's another source of radiation uh, called bremsstrahlung. Now, bremsstrahlung uh, is German for breaking radiation or deceleration radiation. So when a charged particle, a light charged particle like an electron, uh, approaches uh, matter, a nucleus, there's a, a, an electrical force between the negative electron and the positively charged nucleus. And that can cause the, the uh, electron to slow down. When it slows down, it has to give up its energy because energy is conserved. And the way it gives up energy is by as a photon. Now, electrons can be far, can pass at a great distance away from the nucleus and be deflected a small amount or electrons can pass very close to the nucleus and be deflected a great deal. If they're deflected a small amount and give up little energy, that's a low energy photon that's created. If they pass cl uh, close to the nucleus and undergo a, a great deal of uh, deceleration, they can give up a lot of energy, which could be a high energy X-ray photon. Okay, um, now this really is about the interaction of radiation with matter. And so we're going to talk more about this when we talk about how radiation interacts with matter, but it's also a source of photon radiation. And so I wanted to include it here to be complete. Okay, now let's talk about sources of information. Where can you get information about these radioactive decays I've been talking about? Okay, um, well, let's see. I've got some here that I mentioned uh, that are mentioned in the slides. The slides will be posted again. So one is something called the well, well, one source of, of uh, information are books. There are all kinds of books that have been published with all kinds of radiological data. Uh, a commonly used one is the Radiological Health Handbook. It was first published in the 70s by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare the FDA in particular. Uh, 
Um, uh, the data that's in that 1970 book is still used. It's still good data, uh, particularly for safety purposes. Um, there's a radiological health uh, handbook that's been published in recent years. It's much thicker. It's um, from a commercial uh, publisher. It has a compendium of lots of data, including uh, decay data. So that's another good source. Uh, but in this computer age, there's a lot of um, electronic resources that are available to you. One is a local desktop app called a radiological, the Radiological Toolbox. It was developed by Oak Ridge National Lab for the US NRC. You can get it from the US NRC at the RAMP website. You can see that RAMP stands for Radiation Protection Computer Code Analysis and Maintenance Program. You can register with them, uh, become a member uh, of RAMP, and uh, then you'll be able to download many, many different computer codes that are available from them. I did notice that the Oak Ridge National website, National Lab website, is listed right up here, uh, has the software available for download right here. And here's a download of the toolbox right here. So um, the thing about uh, RAMP is there are a few restrictions for foreign nationals. So it might be difficult for some students to get it, but you can get the radiological toolbox off the web uh, from o ORNL. Uh, at the website shown here, you can just Google. The way I did it was I just Googled radiological toolbox. And the first link that came up was the Oak Ridge software. The second link is the RAMP, NRC RAMP website. So that's a resource. It was intended, it was developed by Oak Ridge National Lab for the NRC. The NRC paid for it. And their intent was so that their inspectors and other employees would have access to information at their fingertips while sitting at their desk. So uh, it's a very handy and uh, reliable source of information. Another source of information is on the internet. And I showed you before the chart of the nuclides. Here's the chart of the nuclides from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and it has a lot of good information. So let's just pick a, a nuclide, cobalt 60, just as an example. Well, it's here. And look, when I move my mouse, over that box, it gives me lots of information about the decay. So I copied that onto a slide. What it tells me is copied here so it's legible. It says cobalt 60 data. It gives me the half-life in days and years. It gives me, there are two beta particles, one of them that and 95.8 uh, keV, 99% of the time. Another is 625 keV, 0.12% of the time. Now, those are just what we found in our decay chart for cobalt 60. 99.89% of the time, 0.31 and 1.42 MeV. Now, let's go back to our... Um, okay, oh, I compared them right here. I slide with it compared. So 95.8 uh, keV. And this has a, a, an energy of 0.31 keV. It's not the same because this is giving me the average beta energy instead of the endpoint beta energy. It's about a third of what that is. About a third of 0.31 is about 100, which that's about 100. 1.48, about a third of 1.5 is going to be, which is uh, 1.5 is three halves. A third of that would be uh, one half. And 0.6 is of almost a half. Okay, um, the photon energy is 1.332 uh, uh, MeV and 1.173 MeV. Same thing here that's shown. It, what's shown in the chart of the nuclides matches with what's in the decay chart. If you account for the fact that one's showing the endpoint energy, so you can see the energy level structure, and one showing the average energy. 
Another resource is from the Health Physics Society. It has uh, the information and easy to obtain tabular data. So if we go back to my web site, the way I got here was I uh, searched for HPS, HPSDK data, and it gave me what I'm looking for. There's the, the HPS decay data. So to use this, we choose whatever uh, element we're interested in. Let's go with cobalt 60. So where is cobalt right here? Then I pick the, I, the nuclide I'm interested in, which is 60, and I get the data. Now it tells me that the transitions there are three beta particles that are possible. The frequency, one of them is only 0. 0.0006. It's uh, 0.06%. Uh, essentially, um, uh, and another is 0.001%. Uh, so very infrequent uh, decay possibilities. And there are two photons, just as we saw in the decay chart. Okay, but that's not always the case. Uh, let's pick another one, cesium-137. And when we go look at cesium-137, we find the beta, it tells us we have two beta particles. So let's go back and look for cesium. And it's right here and get 137. And it tells me there are two beta particles. But it also has a note, this is important to, the thing to learn about these decays. There are decays from barium 137M, a two and a half minute half-life that are not included. So the, just like the technesium 99, uh, uh, molybdenum 99 to technesium 99M to technesium 99, there's a, a, a intermediate metastable state that's a barium 137M. So if we go to barium, and we get 137M, we find out there are lots of uh, OJ electrons, conversion electrons, and one photon, with some x-rays as well, but one gamma ray that's of importance, okay? So I believe that's on here. We talk more about it. Uh, the barium 137M shows all the different arrangements that occur after the decay into uh, from season 137 to barium 137M and uh, shows all the possibilities. So here's what we have. Cesium 137 has a, uh, a, a de decay. Uh, the endpoint energy is 0.51 MeV. The um, uh, average energy, and that's 95% of the time, the average energy for that is 0.174. MeV, again, 95% of the time. Uh, there's a, another beta that's 1.17 MeV. Uh, the average energy for that is 5% of the time is 0.416 MeV. Okay. In addition, the, it, when it's, the decay occurs in barium, there's uh, six, uh, a, a 662 keV or 0.662 MeV gamma ray, where barium 137N decays to uh, the, the ground state. And here it is. And it tells what the half-life is for these two uh, decay modes. That's what these, this data is on the right, and the, the chart is a separate one. Okay, um, that's what we have for today. I thank you for your time and attention. Uh, I will uh, be getting some uh, homework together for you uh, and posting it. Uh, so look for that on the website. Um, let's see, today is Friday. So let's say you get it to me by next Thursday. I'll make a note right here. Homework one, do Thursday. Okay, thanks for your attention. I hope we're um, uh, making progress. Uh, have a great week.